Hello, and thank you for tuning in to Answers from the Lab, where we share Mayo Clinic knowledge and advancements on the state of testing and science from laboratory leaders and the people who are making it happen behind the scenes. I'm Dr. Bobby Pritt, Interim Chair of the Department of Laboratory Medicine and Pathology at Mayo Clinic in Rochester, Minnesota. Today, we're joined by Dr. Ellie Thiel, the Director for the Infectious Diseases Serology Laboratory here at Mayo Clinic in the Department of Laboratory Medicine and Pathology in Clinical Microbiology. Dr. Thiel and I work closely together on a number of topics, including diagnosis of vector-borne diseases and other parasitic infections. Um, but today, we're going to be talking about something a little different. So Dr. Thiel, thank you so much for joining us. Thanks for having me back. So today we're going to be talking about typhus, flea-borne typhus. There have been a number of cases of typhus in the news recently in the United States. So can you tell us what the situation is? Yeah, so typhus is generally uncommon in the U.S., um, but it is endemic in some kind of more populated areas of Texas, uh, Hawaii, and California, and particularly in L.A. County, um, which this past year has seen really an alarming rise in typhus cases. Um, I think there were 31 reported in 2010. And now in 2022, we've seen over 170 cases. And then three of those were associated with uh, patients dying, uh, which is the first time that a typhus related death has been um, documented since 1993. Uh, so it's really been, um, been concerning. And then Texas, has really seen a rise over the past few decades as well. I think they had over 700 cases in 20, uh, 2018. Um, wow. Yeah, know, that's quite us. significant. And we yeah. don't think about getting diseases from flea bites. Um, no. You know, you and I, we talk about vector-borne diseases. Of course, on this podcast, we've talked about malaria in the United States as well. So I guess stranger things have happened, but let's talk about flea-borne typhus. Uh, what is it? What causes it? How is it transmitted to humans? Right. So uh, flea-borne typhus, it's also known as murine typhus or endemic typhus. It's caused by uh, the bacteria Rickettsia typhi. It's an intracellular, obligately intracellular bacteria, um, but it's transmitted by infected fleas, as the name would suggest, mm -hmm. which live on um, rats, opossums, or untreated cats and dogs. Mm -hmm. uh, so really, when we think about at-risk individuals, the highest risk um, uh, patients or uh, people that are, you know, could get infected are those that are experiencing homelessness or are living in close proximity to flea-infested um, animals. But when it comes to transmission, it's not actually the bite of the flea that leads to the transmission. Um, really, the, the bacteria is actually in the feces of the flea. So infection occurs when those feces get into uh, skin abrasions, like where the flea bit you, or if they get into mucosal membranes. Yeah, actually, that's a really good point. And you corrected what I said earlier. I said flea bites, which causes often a, a break in the skin. But yes, it's the feces itself that gets into the break, or we accidentally ingest it and then end up potentially with typhus. So right. tell us, Dr. Thiel, what are the most common symptoms of typhus? Right. So infection um, is typically kind of mild with nonspecific symptoms starting anywhere from eight to 16 days after infection. Um, so for those that do develop symptoms, there's typically a triad um, that is discussed, which includes fever, headache, and a rash. And the rash is interesting. It's a maculopapular rash. It starts on the torso typically and then spreads out peripherally, but it spares the palms and soles. So that's kind of a classic feature of this particular rash, even though other infections have that feature um, as well, where it doesn't affect the, the palms and the soles. Um, but um, again, those are kind of the classic symptoms. And even though it's uncommon, some individuals can progress to more severe uh, diseases if they're untreated or if treatment is delayed. And that can lead to various different neurologic, pulmonary, renal uh, um, complications and, and manifestations, including um, septic, septic shock, which can be very dangerous. Um, and 
I'll just say, you know, I, I kind of read up a, on this a little bit more recently because of these cases. And there's two risk factors um, that pe put people at risk for more severe disease, which is um, uh, elderly patients, so increased mm -hmm. uh, age. And then also people that have a G6PD deficiency, which is a glucose 6-phosphate dehydrogenase um, deficiency. And that deficiency is actually a risk factor for severe disease for many rickettsial infections and other infections as well. So um, I think that's an, an interesting tidbit that I that not is an before. interesting tidbit. Right. Also, something that we worry about if you're going to give certain types of drugs, it puts you at risk of certain types of side effects, like treatment for some types of malaria. You use a drug that could be harmful for patients that have G6PD deficiency. Yeah. Yeah. Well, very interesting. Now, from the laboratory standpoint, of course, our emphasis is on accurate diagnosis. How is typhus usually diagnosed? And then maybe you can comment on treatment as well. Yeah. So um, from a routine laboratory perspective, the you know most findings are normal, except the vast majority of patients are the significantly thrombocytopenic. Um, so in patients that are, you know, um, have appropriate risk factors, the rash, the appropriate symptoms, and have this thrombocytopenia, uh, one of the thoughts or one of the uh, infections that should be on the differential is murine typhus. And so when we think about um, diagnostic testing, really that currently relies on serologic evaluation, looking for the presence or absence of IgM and IgG antibodies to rickettsia typhi in, in blood. Um, and definitive diagnosis is really based on showing seroconversion, so going from a negative to a positive on antibody testing, or by showing a fourfold rise in antibody titers uh, between serum that's collected about two to three weeks apart. Um, so one of the challenges, as you can imagine, is that serology is more of a retrospective way to diagnose infection because you got to kind of wait for the mm -hmm. time frame um, to confirm it. And so in these patients where you're considering murine typhus, the recommendation is to start empiric treatment while you wait results. And that's really important in order to decrease the risk of severe consequences. Um, another question that viewers might be you know, asking themselves is what about PCR? Um, mm -hmm. So studies, you know, there have been uh, tests, PCR tests developed for rickettsia typhi, but they're really not available widely. It's mostly in public health labs. Um, so serology is kind of what we have at this point. Um, and then to your question about treatment, treatment is mm -hmm. um, really just a, a course of doxycycline, seven to 10 days in duration. And most patients do show complete recovery. So that's, that's good. Yes, very good. So I guess the important takeaways are that we do have testing, the serologic testing for murine typhus, but really you don't want to wait for those tests to get back. And you certainly don't want to wait for seroconversion. If you're suspecting murine typhus, you have to treat right away because it could potentially be deadly and have severe outcomes. And that would be with doxycycline. And the good news is that doxycycline is used for a lot of tick-borne infections as well. And so I think it's probably fairly common in summer months, especially with some when presenting with an illness that looks like it could be tick-borne or flea-borne uh, to just give doxycycline, which would cover both. We yep, wish we had exactly. a way to just diagnose them when they show up in the office, but at least if you have that clinical suspicion, you could still treat the patient appropriately. Right, right. Now, what about prevention? Um, are there any preventative measures that individuals, communities can take to risk uh, reduce the risk of typhus and typhus outbreaks? Yeah, uh, it's a good question. So there's personal prevention measures, really kind of avoiding placing yourself in those situations where you'd be exposed to infected fleas. Um, and then from a community perspective, you know, obviously controlling rat populations, stray animal populations is important. Um, but as we know, that can be really difficult, difficult to do. So I think it's a, it's a combination of um, ways to avoid getting um, bitten, putting yourself in a scenario where you could be bitten. I think as these kind of as the number of cases unfortunately grow and grow, I think um, from a community perspective, uh, public health agencies are probably gonna put more emphasis on trying to control 
mm -hmm. um, rat populations, flea populations, but I think it's, it's difficult to do. Yeah, well, as a pet owner myself, I know that I always um, bring my pet to the vet and ask about preventative measures for fleas and ticks. So I suppose that's something else you could investigate. Uh, Absolutely. And you want to protect your pets against tick bites as well, since we're talking mm -hmm. about vector-borne diseases. Um, like, for example, dogs can get certain types of tick-borne diseases. So probably best to just protect against all of these arthropod-borne diseases. That's a good point. So yeah. if you have pets, make sure they're up to date on all of their vaccines and, and preventative measures. Good point. Yeah. So I have one last question for you. A little tricky, um, but in your uh, research and your experience, do you think that there's a role that climate change plays in the potential spread of typhus, uh, particularly to new regions or why, why we may be seeing it as a resurgence in areas where it had been previously controlled? Yeah, I think like, you know, many vector borne diseases that we've talked about um, in the past, climate change can impact their distribution if the distribution of the vector itself changes, which is due to expansion of the reservoir um, to different, you know, areas of, um, uh, of, of the region. So I do think climate change can impact, you know, the, the spread of murine typhus. I think there's some social political um, issues that also, you know, the increase in homeless populations or, or those living, um, uh, you know, without kind of a constant, consistent um, shelter can increase that as well. So I think there's multiple factors that are leading to this rise in, in murine typhus. Uh, which really we didn't really think about after, you know, World War I, World War II. Mm -hmm. It's just not something that that is on our radar. Uh, but a number of factors have come into play that have increased the risk of murine typhus and um, increasing its spread, unfortunately. Yeah. Well, thank you, Dr. Thiel. It's always uh, interesting to have these conversations about vector-borne diseases with you, and I'm sure we'll have many more in the future, uh, given all of the things that can be transmitted by ticks, mosquitoes, fleas, and we didn't even get into reduvid bugs, but maybe someday we could talk about that in Chagas disease as well. I think that would be great. The transmission process for Chagas disease is very similar to that. Of right, with the feces. <laughs> yes. yes. Well, another great future topic. Thanks okay. again, Dr. Thiel, for joining us today. Thank you, Dr. Britt. Thank you so much for tuning in to Answers from the Lab. Be sure to subscribe to this podcast and don't forget to tune in every Thursday and every other Tuesday.